Thanks for joining us today. I'm Julie Whitman. I'm the parent advocate on this panel and also a board certified behavior analyst. So uh, I get the privilege of uh, facilitating today's uh, meeting. We're gonna share a ton of resources. Um, Lindsay, if you wanna pull up the, the slideshow, I'll just start. Um, as Lindsay shared, we don't have a case presentation today. Um, that's so that we could provide lots of different resources for you. Um, you can go to the next two slides. Uh, we actually are gonna um, put together a document um, that's just a snapshot in time of all the resources that we're talking about today. And that document isn't gonna be updated over time. It's just gonna be put together as a one-stop shop today for you all. Um, if you do have local resources um, that you've thought of, feel free to put those in the chat and we can add them to the document if it's something that's not gonna be covered by one of our presenters today. So in thinking about where to start after uh, a child's diagnosed with autism, one of the big things that we can do as providers is help families connect to those resources that can be helpful for them to educate them about autism, but also just where to find help, who to call, how to build a team, that's a lot of what today's session is about, how to help with school and the IEP, and then some of those safety-related resources that primary care providers are a really important source of. Um, next slide. So this is the link to that document. We'll probably send it out at the end of today's session as well. Um, it's going to be organized by region um, and then also um, national, statewide. Um, so it, if you're looking for resources that we mentioned today, it'll be in this document. Um, and like I said, we're not gonna be continually updating it, but it will be a place that you can come back to after today's session. So I'm up first talking about a number of different national uh, resources that are out there. And one of them um, in terms of connecting families with information about autism to learn more are these autism internet modules. I've seen different um, staff of school districts um, and other providing organizations use them as training modules. Um, they're fantastic um, in terms of comprehensive. It's a source of information um, for parents about autism. Next slide. There's also another set of parent training modules around autism from the UC Davis Mind Institute. This is a fantastic um, source of information. They have a ton of different uh, videos and presenters on different topics, but then within that website, there's what's called the ADEPT training piece, which is autism distance education parent training. This is a little more parent friendly than the first one, um, but it's again, another great source of information for parents. Next slide. Uh, another one out of Florida is this National Center for Pyramid Model Implementation, um, the NCPMI. This website uh, has great link to a family engagement section where they have a fabulous set of different flyers that you can give out. A lot of them are geared toward different specific behaviors. Um, there's a backpack connection, which is an example here on the right. These are flyers that you can give um, that are around different topics. If you have a family that comes in who's concerned about their child biting or how to give directions, these are just really great one page, simple to use handouts. They also come in a variety of different languages. Um, I think they have Spanish ones. I've seen some uh, in Chinese as well. And there's some uh, under the green tab that are geared more toward families. Um, and so it's just another great resource um, to have in your, in your practice to, to give those handouts if someone comes in with a specific concern. Next slide. Um, of course, Autism Speaks has a, a really wide variety of toolkits that are available. If you can refer parents to their website, they can get signed in, um, set up an account. The information's not shared, it's completely safe, and they can download these different toolkits, um, and they just keep expanding these to include more and more. Um, but if they're having specific struggles with sleep, there's a whole toolkit on that. Um, there's a number of different ones available. So 
Uh, there's the first 100 days kit as well for newly diagnosed families. Um, that's a great one to send home with people um, when you have that download um, from the testing when they're receiving that diagnosis as well. So that's a great resource on the national level. Uh, next slide, Lindsay. Um, then there's a variety of different resources out there related to safety. These are fantastic to explore. Um, one is called the Alert Me Bands, which are here in the picture um, that give people, particularly first responders, um, an idea of the child's disability. Um, there are a number of different GPS trackers that are available. And uh, I think when Katie talks about the support budgets that are available for, for children who qualify, uh, my child got one of these GPS devices through uh, her support budget. So um, the safety seatbelt is also available that uh, cues first responders that the child um, has a disability or has autism. It's just a wrap that goes over their seatbelt. Um, and then there's a few other programs like the autism ID card um, and the big red safety box, uh, there's a link to that that we'll put in, in the resources. Um, it's a great, great um, kit that comes if you apply for it. That also includes um, door alarms and window alarms. And it's a, a really nice kit that helps parents think about the variety of safety concerns that their child with autism um, might face. Drowning is the number one cause of death with children who have autism. So thinking about swimming lessons is also in the back of our minds. Um, there's a great movie called Be Safe and it's um, starring people with autism and it's geared toward that same audience and it teaches them how to interact with police or first responders. Um, and then there's a number of resources around uh, child harnesses, how to stay safe within a crowd that we're gonna um, send out to you in that document as well. Next slide, Lindsay. Um, one of the state resources I wanted to draw your attention to was the University of Idaho Center on Disabilities and Human Development in Moscow. Um, they have a variety of projects um, that are statewide. One of them is the Idaho Assistive Technology Project. And I've utilized this program and their lending libraries, which are located at several different places throughout the state, Coeur d'Alene, Boise, and Eastern Idaho. And their website, Idaho AT for All, can uh, link families with different um, sources of assistive technology that they can try out if they're thinking about getting that before they go ahead and purchase it. Um, I've had lots of different speech language pathologists borrow devices that they're trialing when trying to get a child uh, an assistive technology speech generating device. So they're a fantastic resource. Another one of their projects is called Idaho Stars. This is the child care assistance when you dial 211. If you have families that are struggling with inclusive child care um, or they're being charged more because their child has a disability, which is illegal. These folks are where you can call to help, um, help find inclusive childcare, help get training for a childcare center, or help um, educate them around laws um, related to inclusive childcare. Uh, SESTA is another project under this umbrella, the Special Education Support and Technical Assistance for Special Ed teachers throughout the state and programs that can seek help there. Um, the Child and Youth Study Center, I know Gwen Mitchell is on the call today. Um, Gwen is the psychologist in the Child and Youth Study Center. That's another project um, at the CDHD. They also host the Autism Summit in the state. And this is their website. If you have uh, time, check out their, their projects. It's a fabulous source of information across the state. Uh, next slide, Lindsay. So next I'm gonna turn it over to Anna Smith. Anna's gonna talk about the infant toddler program in our state. This is a fantastic program that uh, I've been able to take advantage of with my own child. So I will turn it over to Anna. And Anna, if you want to introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Anna Smith. Um, I am with the Infant and Toddler Program. 
I am a program specialist for our child find program and also our um, direct intervention program. So uh, I've been with the department for 35 years. I started when I was like seven. So, you know, you don't have to worry about the math there. It's okay. Uh, so I've seen um, the infant toddler program grow and change um, over the years. And so we're gonna to focus today on kind of um, our child find program. Uh, next slide, please. So we have a central um, child find program that is part of the infant and toddler program. Um, it's centralized, um, meaning that we run the entire ongoing developmental milestones program out of central office. Um, again, it is named developmental milestone. And um, a lot of people aren't aware that it is available to any child in Idaho in the age of birth to their third birthday. Um, our Child Find or our Developmental Milestones Program, in addition to our direct intervention program, um, all the services that we provide are provided at no charge to families. So um, a family never receives a bill from us. I like to tell them we don't even have the capacity to send a bill. So if you get a bill and you think it's from us, call me because it's not. <laughs> uh, next slide, please. Um, part of our developmental milestones um, program is really focusing on um, that early identification of children that may be having um, some red flags, you know, around um, possible autism or sensory um, processing disorders, a variety of things. But the, the social emotional instruments that we are currently using is our ages and stages questionnaires, the social emotional two or the ASQ SE2. And that screens for the development of communication and social emotional skills. It's currently available through us in English and Spanish. And then we um, also include the MCHAT RF or modified checklist for autism and toddlers revised with uh, follow-up. It's also available at no cost. Um, and I think the reason I, I put that on here is because the MCHAT RF is, re, is available to all of you at no cost. It's a downloadable PDF and the instructions are downloadable. And, you know, so you can, you could do this and it's, you don't have to invest any money in it. Currently it's not available in electronic format. Um, so we at the developmental milestones program are still uh, mailing this out when the families. Um, when the child reached the age where the MCHAT would be appropriate. Um, next slide, please. Just occurred to me, I keep looking at the slides I have open and not the ones on the screen. And I'm like, why isn't it progressing? And it's like, oh, I'm not looking in the right place. Um, so the ASQ SE2 are offered when a child reaches 12 months or 30 months. And then we also offer the MCHAT RF. Um, we, we mail it at 16 months, um, 18 months if the child wasn't already enrolled with us and they, they come in at 18. And then we again send it at 24 months because we see so much developing development happening in those six months um, that we wanna make sure that we have it covered. So then, a family that is enrolled in the developmental milestones program are receiving very specific social emotional screenings from 12 months through 30 months. So basically almost every six months in that time frame, they're receiving some sort of um, questionnaire regarding or screener regarding uh, the child's social emotional development. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I wanna talk really specifically about the MCHAT. Um, it is recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics and it is created to screen children uh, between the ages of 16 and 30 months that are for the risk factors related to the uh, autism spectrum disorders. Um, it's just, it's so important. The earlier we can help identify these children and get them sent for diagnostic testing and um, 
a diagnosis just really opens up the family's um, ability to get other services they, they need. So um, I always like to joke around and say, you know, everybody goes, well, somebody said, wait and see. And it's like, no, don't wait and see. Um, it doesn't cost anything to have a screening done or have an evaluation done through the infant toddler program. So let's go ahead and refer. And if there's nothing to worry about, then we're happy to tell the families that and report that back to the doctors. So please, you know, if you have a family that's kind of hesitant and say, you know, I, I just want to wait and see, let's, you please try your best to encourage them um, to at least come into the infant toddler program or give us a call so that we can, we can provide these services to them at no, no expense. Um, and hopefully we can tell them that they're right. There's absolutely nothing wrong. Um, but we, we would like to, to be able to do that. Um, the MCHAT really focuses on communication and the social emotional development of a child. And it provides valuable insight into how children see and respond to their world. Oftentimes we have families, uh, our parents, you know, um, because that's all they know, they don't know that what the child's doing is different than other, ch other children that may not be having these uh, risk factors. Um, so it's really good for the families to be able to go through the M chat and, and fill it out and gives them the opportunity to ask questions. Next slide, please. Um, once a questionnaire is uh, once a questionnaire is completed, uh, I train staff at the infant toddler program, um, review it, a follow up with families as outlined, um, and then we share the results with the families. If the families give it that uh, next slide, please. Sorry. If the family um, or if the scores indicate that a referral is should be made to the infant toddler program for evaluations, we go ahead and get that set up with the families. And if the parent provided consent, the results are shared with their child's medical home. Next slide, please. Um, we have it set up now that if a fam family is completing a screener online, they can give us a re uh, authorization to disclose to the physician right there when they do that online. If they're doing it by mail, we send them out an authorization so that we can share uh, the information with their pediatricians or medical homes, I'm sorry. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the, we also have available um, we can help set up a screening in your clinic. So if you need some support in setting up a, a, a screenings in your clinic, um, go ahead and send me an email. And if you would like to just refer your child for a screening or, or an evaluation, you can visit us at our website and um, uh, send in a, a referral that way, or you can send it to me directly. I think that's the end of my slides. Yes. Fabulous. Thank you so much for sharing those really awesome resources. Um, our next presenter is Katie Rigoli um, from the Developmental Disabilities Program. We gave her a little bit longer since she's covering a number of different programs. Yes, thank you. So I am the North Hub Supervisor for the Children's Developmental Disabilities Program. Um, I'm actually not involved with the actual um, oversight aspects of the Katie Beckett program, but we do help families apply for the Katie Beckett program because they have to have Medicaid in order to access developmental disability services, as well as other services um, like behavioral health services and things like that in the state of Idaho. And we do get a lot of questions about that. So I'm happy to talk with you about that today. Um, go ahead and we'll switch to the next slide here. Um, so Katie Beckett is basically just another type of Medicaid, and it is for families who are over income for a typical Medicaid rate code. Um, it is for children who are living at home who have long-term developmental disabilities or complex medical needs. And when the family applies for Katie Beckett, they are actually applying for the child and based on their income. So the child can make no more than about $2,400 a month 
which most children are, are not coming anywhere close to making. Um, however, another piece of that is that they can have no more than $2,000 of resources in their name. So if a child has received a large inheritance or um, maybe they were in an accident and there was a GoFundMe to raise funds for them, if it was placed in that child's name, that can affect their eligibility for the Katie Beckett program. So um, that is something that can do that. Um, however, the Katie Beckett program doesn't have any sort of penalty if families do want to move those funds into another type of account, ABLE account, 529, something like that, um, or even into another savings account. Um, and so the child must meet both um, the income eligibility as well as the diagnostic criteria. Go ahead, next slide. Um, so the first uh, piece of the diagnostic criteria is that they have to have a developmental disability or a complex medical need. Um, both of those would require documentation from their primary care provider. So that's a form that you would possibly see come from Liberty Healthcare. The developmental disabilities that are eligible for uh, this diagnostic criteria include um, autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, cerebral palsy, seizure disorder, Down syndrome, and it could also be a developmental delay under the age of five. Um, one of the biggest pieces that is hard for um, community providers and families to understand is that the individual also has to meet what we call ICFID level of care. So that individual has to have uh, a lot of impact to their uh, functional limitations. There has to be at least three areas of their life that are impacted. So sometimes we'll see a family, maybe their child has an autism diagnosis, the child is very impacted socially, but maybe less so in other areas of their life. They apply for Katie Beckett, they have the DD diagnosis, but then they don't meet those three substantial functional limitations. I think it's worth it for families to apply because Medicaid is huge for families, um, but it is worth noting that if you have a child who um, maybe doesn't have a lot of areas of delay, their likelihood of approval is going to be a lot lower. And then finally, they have to have a need for lifelong or extended duration services. Next slide. Um, there's another um, pathway. So when you're applying for Katie Beckett, there's two different pathways. So there's that developmental disabilities pathway, but then we also have complex medical needs or physical disability. So this would be for an individual who has a chronic condition. So I've seen kids with um, diabetes, with cancer, um, children who maybe have a physical disability, but they don't have any sort of developmental delay. Um, so this would be a child who meets the social security criteria. And they also require that level of care provided in a medical institution. And again, the physician would see the documentation um, that the child needs to have services in their home. And then they have to also verify it's safe and appropriate to provide care in the home for that child. So those are the two different diagnostic pathways. Um, before families apply, we do recommend that they have copies of all their documentation. So it would, um, any sort of psychological evaluations, um, doctor notes, um, things from the neuropsych, um, anything that's going to help with that eligibility. So the first step when a family wants to apply for Katie Beckett is to apply for Medicaid through self-reliance because Katie Beckett is Medicaid. And so the family will apply and they're going to indicate during that interview process or during when they're filling out the application that their child has a developmental disability and that they need that in home care. And then what happens is self-reliance will look at everything. They'll say, oh yeah, you definitely don't qualify financially. And they're gonna send the referral on to our contractor, Liberty Healthcare. And Liberty Healthcare is going to do um, a Vineland with the family. And they're going to go through and look at all the different um, adaptive skills that that child has, as well as any externalizing or internalizing problem behavior. And, um, and so that will be the process on, on their end. Um, the reason that we say families should have all their documentation prior to applying is because when Liberty sends them that application, they have 10 days to return it. So um, that is really fast. Um, 
And if they don't have that documentation, it can be hard getting that from the OTPT speech primary care provider. So it's nice if they have it in the beginning. Go ahead and next slide. So um, timeliness and responsiveness are critical. Like I said, there's that 10 day timeline for families with the application. Um, and then Liberty will call them, they'll leave them a message. If the family's voicemail box is full or they can't leave a message, that can cause a lot of barriers, as I'm sure that some of you have encountered as well. Um, and then just keeping that demographic info updated because if a family goes into self-reliance and applies and maybe they didn't have the correct info, if they send it over to Liberty, they're not gonna get the application. Um, the, the Katie Beckett Medicaid, once it's approved, can be backdated up to 90 days if the family or the child were still eligible financially. So if you have a family who's had a lot of maybe um, hospital stays or services during that time, they can request that be backdated and it can be rebilled with Medicaid as a secondary. Um, families are charged a premium based on their income, so they will get statements in the mail, but they can opt out and there's no penalty for not paying those premiums. Um, however, there are still some services with Katie Be Beckett Medicaid that require a, a copay, and most of the time we see this with speech OT or PT. The speech OT or PT can choose to charge the copay, but if they do choose to charge that copay to these families, they are responsible for paying that, and we have had families who thought it was the premium, chose not to pay it, and ended up going to collections, so it is a big deal. Um, and then Katie Beckett, Medicaid, um, the eligibility is at least every three years um, for a full eval, and then annually they can request that financial updated information. Um, let's see, go ahead, next slide. So Katie Beckett, Medicaid would act as a secondary insurer for families who have another insurer and um, one question we do get a lot is, do I have to keep my child on my primary insurance? And they do not. Um, and then Katie Beckett Medicaid works almost exactly like other Medicaid besides that copay and, and um, premium piece. Um, but there are some exclusions. So Katie Beckett Medicaid was designed so that families who don't qualify financially, their children can receive services in the home. So anytime a child is out of the home, let's say the family is seeking psychiatric residential treatment through EPSDT, their Medicaid would not cover that. So that is something that will oftentimes really surprise providers and families, but if they're on that Katie Beckett Medicaid, that cannot be paid. Also families on Katie Beckett Medicaid are not eligible for the preventative health assistance, which is that, um, I think it's like $20, to a gym membership if they're overweight or underweight per month. So those are some of the limitations of Katie Beckett. Next slide. And so um, I guess that segues into the Children's DD program. So um, we can provide case management to families who have a DD diagnosis and do not have Medicaid, and we can help them through that Katie Beckett process before they're even involved in our program, which is something that's been really neat over the last couple of years to be able to do. So um, you can just refer families to us directly. I've put in the referral forms um, as a resource in my presentation, um, and we can assign a case manager throughout the state to help that family to apply for the Katie Beckett Medicaid if they need it. Um, so um, our program, the Children's DD program, we serve individuals from birth to 21. So we overlap a little bit with infant toddler and with the adult program. We don't provide any direct services. All the services for developmental disabilities in the state of Idaho are provided by um, independent providers or developmental disabilities agencies but we can provide case management. And we have a great team of case managers who love to help families um, coordinating different community services, making referrals to different services, helping families with transportation, getting hooked up with that, getting hooked up with the reimbursement piece, make a lot of referrals to IPOL. <laughs> we make, make a lot of referrals to the different people on this calls to, to help families out. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we can also provide case management for families who need to apply for Katie Beckett, families who have English as their second language or anyone in the infant toddler program before they even qualify for our DD program. 
Next slide. If you want to refer to our program, um, you can fax that referral form with notes is the most helpful to any of the hubs. That way, uh, if we already have a diagnosis, we, we have that in that referral piece. A lot of times we'll get history and physical forms from uh, primary care providers. Um, any other provider who wants to send something, you could send our DD referral form. And then families can apply for our program also directly through the website. They do not have to, to contact us directly. They could just send that in independently. Go ahead there. So, okay, this is our link to our website. And like I mentioned, all of our services do require Medicaid. Um, I always laugh when people want me to come and talk about our program because it is very complex. We like to say there's a large menu of services available to you depending on what your needs are. Um, but it can be really confusing for families and that's where it's nice to be able to have that case manager who can help them really look at what their situation is and look at what individualized services are going to be best for them and what route to take. Um, just another piece that I have to mention is that I'm sure many of you are aware that there are wait lists in place throughout most of the state for all of our support and intervention services. And those are not wait lists that are imposed by Medicaid or imposed by like our program. Those are wait lists that are just due to provider shortages for the services. Um, for Initial families, if you have a family and you want to say, go find out about DD services, um, honestly, most of the time, even though it's not required for some of our services, we do recommend just putting in an application and going through the eligibility process so that the family knows what their options are and they can um, just go from there. And that application is in our website. Next slide. So again, for our program, we have two different options. We have DD supports. And so that is available for children birth through 18, and they have to have a developmental disabilities diagnosis. And so developmental disability diagnosis um, is the same as the Katie Beckett program. So autism, cerebral palsy, seizure disorder, Down syndrome, intellectual disability are closely related disorder. Families have to apply with documentation of the disability, and then they go to, again, Liberty Healthcare, who will contact them, schedule the Vineland, do a medical social interview, and then the eligibility or the denial letter will come to the hub supervisors. That application process currently takes anywhere from 60 to 90 days, depending on how responsive the family is. Um, and then if you or any families have questions about intake, they can call the hub supervisor of the hub they're in, or they can also call our intake line. Go ahead, next slide. So our DD supports, um, supports are not able to teach new skills. They provide supports in the homing community to practice skills that they're learning in other services or to provide caregiver respite. Um, all children who qualify for developmental disability supports have a case manager, and they also have to go through that eligibility with Liberty every year. Next slide. Um, when a child qualifies for supports, they're given a budget of anywhere from $4,900 to $14,900 that has to be used for DD services, and it has to be, a, um, and, it, and they get to choose a pathway and they have to have a case manager. Um, so this is where Julie had mentioned goods and services. So if a family qualifies for supports, there's two different, again, pathways they can choose. They can choose traditional services and get services through a developmental disabilities agency or an independent provider. And those services are family education, respite, and community-based supports. Or they can go family directed. And if they do that, we always say that's more flexibility and more responsibility because the family has to go through some additional classes, they have to get a support broker, um, and they become um, the person who's like really directing their child's budget, but then they can hire individuals who maybe they know, grandma, neighbors, somebody from their church or their community, um, and they can pay them through their developmental disabilities budget. Um, and then they can also receive some goods or services um, through that. So we have individuals with autism with sensory needs who are in OT, who need different um, 
maybe a weighted blanket or a sensory swing um, based on that child's individualized needs with the recommendation from the appropriate provider, they can have that paid for, whereas um, that would be denied typically through durable medical equipment. So um, when a family gets the support, they can access either traditional or family directed services. So um, because of the lack of providers, we have seen a lot more families go family directed and hiring natural supports, um, just because that way they can at least get maybe some respite or something. Next slide. We also have um, intervention available. So um, intervention is available to children birth through the month of their 21st birthday. Eligibility is based on functional or behavioral need. Um, so they don't have to have a developmental disability diagnosis. So if you have an individual who has an IQ, IQ cutoff is 75, let's say they have an IQ of 76 or 77, they would qualify to receive intervention where they would not qualify for our supports program without any other diagnosis anyway. Um, I will say that most of our independent providers and DDAs, most of their experience comes in working from children with developmental disabilities. However, if it's a closely related um, developmental disability or developmental delay, excuse me, um, then they've also worked with individuals without a developmental disability diagnosis. And then again, services are, are provided through an independent provider or a DDA. And then this is what I always tell parents is the meat and potatoes. This is where they're learning how to communicate or working on interfering problem behavior. They're um, you know, going to the grocery store and practicing, actually teaching and practicing with the family, like this is how you stay with mom, um, working on you know, um, sitting at the table with family. Uh, and then they also can work with OT, PT and speech and interdisciplinary services and do cross training. They also have a crisis intervention service. So um, this is the, the DD intervention program. Next slide. Uh, so for DD intervention, they do not have to have a supports budget, but again, if we have a family who's new to the program and they do have a developmental disability, it can be helpful to just go in the door and apply for both at the same time. As you can tell, this is really confusing, so it's helpful to have somebody like assigned to you who's helping you figure that out. Um, case management is optional if they only have intervention, um, and then we don't authorize this. It goes through our contractor, Telogen. Next slide. And then I just wanted to briefly mention something that is not part of our program, but we do have families who are getting a referral from ABA, from their um, primary care provider. Um, and we have more providers statewide who are providing this. It's the Optum Behavior Modification. It's a behavioral health service. It's not a DD service. Um, and providers are enrolled in and approved through Optum, but it is the ABA model. Um, yep, and then children can potentially receive both behavior modification and excess DD services. So I know that was a lot. I tried to put a lot in the slides so you can reference it again later, <laughs> but um, I also put in different links to our, our services, the referral form and all that. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Katie. We'll have a few questions for you in the chat that you can look at and hopefully we can get to at the end. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Angela Lindig. She's from the Idaho Parents Unlimited program, and um, I'll let you introduce yourself, Angela. Thank you. Um, I think I'm in the coldest conference room ever in Idaho Falls right now. We're, do, we're, we're actually training parents. So um, uh, I'll try to go quickly through this because I know we're short on time. I see a lot of familiar faces and names. So many of you are very familiar with Idaho Parents Unlimited or IPOL, as was Katie mentioned. That's our acronym. Um, let me go to this next slide, please. Okay. So um, some of the, uh, I, I, I just only have about eight slides to go through. So I'll just go to the next one and I'll explain our programs and we'll go one more. That's just a parent testimonial. So see how easy this is? Okay, um, our program areas. So Idaho Parents Unlimited is the, we are a statewide nonprofit organization. Um, we serve families who have children with disabilities from birth to 26. Uh, um, every and any issue, if a, system, if a family is touching a system, we can assist them with whatever their 
working with. And everything that we do is always at no cost to families. So I'm just gonna kind of go through our program areas and then show some ways that we can help. Um, primary, number one, we are funded through the US Department of Education Office of Special Education Programs. And so we do a lot of work around special education, um, and related services. So we provide that training. Um, we provide one-to-one -one assistance for families on helping them with eligibility for um, and their IEPs and you know anything that they might be dealing with with educational systems. And that includes infant and toddler services as well. So um, the second area that people may not be as familiar with is that we are the Family to Family Health Information Center that is funded through the Health Resources Services Administration um, at, at the federal level. And um, we essentially do the same thing that we do with special education. We provide training and information around everything and anything to do with a family's health. And that includes navigating all of the community services. So everything that Katie just talked about, we have whole trainings on helping parents understand how how to navigate Medicaid systems and DD services and all of those things. Um, again, one-to-one -one assistance, we do group trainings, we do workshops, et cetera. And then the third area that we assist families with is um, we have arts programming and a lot of people don't realize that we do have this. Um, our arts are, we have teaching artists that work in classrooms and community centers throughout the state to ensure kids with disabilities have access to high quality arts education. But one of the most important things that we do with our arts programming is actually through a contract with the Idaho Division of Vocational Rehabilitation. And that is our work of art program. And we, uh, we provide uh, employment skills training to youth with disabilities using the arts as the primary vehicle working with community clients. So those are our three key program areas. Let's go to the next slide. And these are just some examples of um, maybe ways that we might assist a family. So obviously, um, and when I say any disability, any, any um, diagnosis, we, we work with everyone, but also um, certainly families who have children with autism. Um, but these are some examples where a parent might be looking for eligibility questions. This number two is probably the biggest one that we've seen in the last two years. It just keeps on, they keep on coming. So um, parents who are new to our state, um, we have a lot of, I think at one point we were taking a call a week um, from parents who are moving to Idaho and our no two systems are done the same um, from state to state. So really a lot of educating um, parents on how to access and apply for certain services. Um, we deal a lot with families who um, are having behavioral issues with their kids, whether that be in school or the home. We have a whole training on um, positive behavioral interventions and supports and helping families understand behavioral plans. Um, and then we do a lot of professional partner work. We do a lot of collaborative trainings with, our, with various partners around the state. So please, if this is something you wanna do with us, get with me, I'm happy to coordinate some, some trainings together. And then finally, I already explained our, our work of art program. I also like to point out um, that picture is just my oldest daughter at her transition to adulthood IEP meeting um, when, when she went through um, that transition to adulthood. And I don't know if Anna's still, Anna still on the call, so I'll just go ahead and since you were the one to throw out that you were there for 35 years, Anna was our first developmental um, specialist who came into our home when Miss Amber was only uh, 16, 16 months old, I think, maybe younger than that. But so we've all been at this for a little while, haven't we? Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. These are some examples of our training workshops. So we have um, a lot around transition to adulthood. We do trainings around advocacy. In fact, we've got a training here in Idaho Falls at 5.30 today on helping families um, advocate on behalf of early childhood systems. Um, we do uh, a lot, like I mentioned, around um, early intervention services uh, and then even cyber safety, bullying, um, and those kinds of things. So uh, our, I think our, our most popular um, training, however, is what we're doing right here, right now, and that's in going through the IEP and really helping families know how to read an, an individualized education program and um, how that gets implemented. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, and this is just on average, um, how many people we're assisting on an annual basis. Um, uh, we have a staff of eight. <laughs> so we do, and we're statewide. We take a lot of calls and um, we, let's go to the next slide. 
we are the parents we serve. Um, just FYI, um, we are a parent-led organization. So as I mentioned, um, myself and my staff are all um, navigating these same systems. We have kids with disabilities and um, uh, we, we too have had to figure things out as we go. So, um, and that's just all of, that's the, we call ourselves Ipulians. So this is all of the Ipulians on the screen here. All right, and I think that probably comes to the last slide here. Um, some of our resources, um, our website, our Facebook and Instagram, um, our monthly workshops, they're all archived on our, on our we, we have on-demand videos. So any of our trainings that we do, they're on our website. Um, we have links to um, our uh, community partners and all, really the majority of what we do is our one-to-one -one, um, assistance in navigating systems for families. And then one thing I didn't mention is that we're that very actively involved in our Western States Regional Genetics Network. Um, and so we have a tool to help families understand um, accessing genetic services or genetics education. That's a, a little unique. And then... Next slide. And then I, that's it. See how fast I was? I uh, typically take one to two hours to talk about all that we do, but we wanted to just really be here to let you know that we are a resource, no cost to families. Um, and, and again, any system a family is touching, we can assist them with those services. There's, it, if we don't know it, we're gonna figure it out. So let us be a resource to all of you. Thank you, Thanks. Angela. <laughs> I can say personally, I have accessed iPoll this year. Uh, they helped me figure out whether I needed to file a state complaint and they were fabulous. So please take advantage of them. Our last presenter today is our own Molly Reader um, and she's gonna talk about the Early Start Denver model. Hi everybody. So exciting to be able to share today with all these amazing people and resources. I'm gonna share really quickly and briefly about the Early Start Denver model or ESDM as it's often referred to. Um, it is a relationship-based intervention approach. It's comprehensive, manualized, it includes targets and teaching strategies for our very young kids with autism. So ideally kids shortly after they get diagnosed in those early years when we know the brain is most plastic and responsive to change. Um, it's a, an approach that blends behavioral and developmental principles. Um, it has a wide evidence base starting back in the 1980s. Um, it is geared towards kids 12 to 60 months, but I will say, as I might mention later, that I utilize the tools, including the checklist, um, which is its assessment tool um, for kiddos well beyond even that 60 month mark, because it's just such a good resource for assessment and developing treatment goals. It spans all developmental domains and it can be utilized across settings. So it can, it can be used in a classroom, in a group, one-to-one, and it can be delivered by all manner of disciplines. So OT, speech, developmental pediatrician, psychologist, ABA therapist, all of that. Um, the founders back in the 80s really wanted to find a way to take um, the teaching principles from ABA and pivotal response training, which are those most you know, excellent teaching strategies that are well accepted to be one of the best means of progress for our kiddos with autism, and then kind of embed it in a relationship-based approach. So it really seeks to, to marry those two things together. Next slide, please. So I'll talk really briefly about the evaluation process and then what intervention looks like. So during the evaluation, um, the, the therapist or the, the provider um, administers the curriculum checklist. So this is um, the, the Early Start Curriculum Checklist, which has four levels that correspond approximately to different um, uh, developmental ages for kids on the spectrum. And each area, um, each level, excuse me, covers all those developmental domains, including receptive communication, expressive communication, imitation, play skills, cognition, fine motor skills, growth motor skills, um, behavior, and then uh, daily living skills, so dressing and feeding and things like that. So even though as a as professional, you might be coming with a particular skill set, it really helps you become a generalist and look at all these developmental domains. Um, the idea being that as children play, uh, they're using all these skills. So why not target them at the same time? 
Um, and then the evaluation process really strives to incorporate those, their, the family's values and their preferences and partners with the families to um, really glean from them what are the, the biggest areas of difficulty for your family and what would make the biggest change and then really tailor the goal areas um, around those preferences and partnering with the, the parents. Next slide, please. So um, uh, in intervention, as you deliver therapy to the child, um, well, excuse me, I forgot to mention, obviously you give the checklist and then you uh, ideally pick multiple goals within each of those developmental domains. And then you target the goals through um, child-led play. Um, where the child and the, the adult are really co-constructionists um, in these, what, what ESDM likes to call joint activity routines. And they're really um, just play routines um, where there's joy and it's so fun. Uh, there's joy and engagement. And then the, the therapist is really using those teaching principles from ABA and pivotal response and the Denver model and um, applying the goals within those play routines. So to give a brief example, maybe the therapist uh, presents like some building blocks, the child picks them up and starts maybe inspecting them up against the light. Um, so the adult uses that idea and starts to imitate holding the blocks up into the light and then maybe add sound effects like a rocket ship and comes down and it tickles the, the kiddo's tummy. And if the child enjoys that, so they start to do it over and over. And that's where the repetition and the play comes in. And the child or the, the therapist can start layering in the different motor goals and the language goals and expanding that play routine um, so that there's you know, neural firing and um, just really good teaching happening. And then a heavy emphasis on collecting really good data so that um, we know that the child is, is making progress. Next slide, please. So the downside of all of this is that um, as of now, there are uh, very few ESDM certified therapists in the state of Idaho. It's kind of a rigorous bear of a process. But this is where the gold mine is, um, is in the resources. So there are two um, really excellent manuals. The first that you'll see the blue one there is meant for um, multi providers and interventionists. Um, it's a little more heady, goes into all the neurology and different stuff like that. Um, the middle one, the orange manual, um, is the early start for your child with autism, and, um, and it is geared towards families and parents, so it's really readable, um, and it's one of the best resources I found in terms of helping a family understand what it looks like to play with their child with autism, learn to take joy in that play process, and then become a teacher to them. Um, so it's really excellent and I highly recommend it for families and it could be something that you recommend for the families you work with too. And then that last one is a picture of the um, developmental, or excuse me, the curriculum checklist, the ESCM checklist. Um, and I think it's a really great resource um, for interventionists and um, providers because it gives such a nice hierarchy of skills. So even if you don't need to be certified to use any of these things, anyone and everyone can. Um, and it just really helps uh, target your intervention. So that's that for ESDM. And it looks like we have three minutes left. If we have any um, questions, we can take those now. I just saw one earlier from the chat that asked for psychologists who diagnose autism, do parents take the report to the primary care provider to complete the paperwork? I think that would be for, for you, Katie, and for the infant toddler program. I would say that parents do uh, take the report um, the PCP doesn't complete the Katie Beckett application, the parent does. And so they would just wanna make sure they have a copy of the psych eval on hand. And the same goes with the infant toddler program. If they have the evaluation, if they have it on hand, we'll take a copy of it and we'll use that to speed along eligibility. Um, but they always should share those reports with their, their medical home um, so that we're all kind of 
looking at the same thing. So I would definitely include, I would definitely encourage them to um, make sure their primary care provider got a copy of that report as well. And Michelin, I tried to answer your question in my last uh, chat. That is a very complicated question because habilitative intervention can be using the ABA model if they're using the evidence-based model, if the DDA or the independent provider is, but they also can be using evidence-informed practice. So habilitative intervention isn't versus ABA. Some HI providers or CHIS providers, children's intervention providers, use ABA and some use principles of ABA as well as other evidence-informed techniques. Mm 